Well, before we get started, it's so great to be up here with you. It's so fun. Thank you. We've been talking a lot about these things, so it's great. To, now we get to talk about it in front of you. <clears throat> I have a deep theological question to ask before we get into the message today. We were talking one morning in, uh, in, in Genesis. Uh, we're going to spend a little time in Genesis today, but in, a, in the earlier part of Genesis, um, it talks about how um, you know, God saw that it wasn't good for man to be alone, so he made him a helpmeet. And all of a sudden, the, we were talking, the question popped in my mind, how come woman didn't need a helpmeet? Okay, a lot of men cook. I'm sure right here, a lot of men cook, don't you? Oh, yeah, I got a raising of hands. <clears throat> I, I just realized, you know, women do everything, in, in, including, you know, working a job, taking care of the family, raising the kids, everything that they do, plus they help their husbands. And all we got to worry about is ourselves, and we can't even do that by ourselves. We, <laughs> God just did a, be a better job on the second attempt, you know. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> so, thanks. I need you. <laughs> I need you. Yeah, we need each other. Thank you, Jesus. It's good. It's good not to be alone. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, that was a wonderful thing that you did, Brian, when you gave us a moment for the Lord to speak to us, because he said, he, 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 he just jumped right in there, and he said, I think I want you to share your conclusion first. <laughs> so, man, it also made a lot of sense. Um, how many of you have heard of the four spiritual laws? You grew up with Camp's Crusade for Christ, probably used them to tell people about Jesus. Uh, who can tell me what the first spiritual law is? Anybody? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Remember that? How many have heard that before? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That is the first spiritual law of the four spiritual laws, that little booklet that Camp's Crusade put out. And it's true. And the only thing that I'm beginning to realize is that in Western culture, we interpret it differently than God does. Because, as Francis Safer said, our, our focus tends to be on our personal peace and affluence. Our personal happiness. <clears throat> and so... What I'm starting to understand is that God's wonderful plan for our life is not about our personal happiness. But if we let Jesus bring us into his wonderful plan, we will be completely happy. But we won't be completely happy because we have all the things that we want. <laughs> There'll be something deeper and richer that he's going to bring us into. And uh, this all, a lot of this discussion today actually came out of uh, your messages recently, Brian, especially the one where you, you talked about the difference between a setback and a setup. How every setback we experience in life is just a setup for Jesus to make us more like him. And so we're just going to continue on with that thread of thought. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, and the key verse for this message is uh, Matthew 5, verse 48. And why don't we start with that? This is in the New Living Translation. Most of them are. I've come to like that translation. It's succinct and simple. And so, go ahead. Matthew 5, 48. But you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Yeah. Do you ever wonder how a gracious, loving, merciful, forgiving God could require his people to be perfect? Uh, in the little teaser I sent to Rachel this week that she put out, uh, the answer was, well, he does even better than that. He works in us every day to make us perfect. And the word perfect there doesn't mean what we generally think of when we think of the word perfect. When we say something is perfect, that means the paint job doesn't have a flaw. That, it, it's not to be unflawed. That's not what this word means. The word is Aramaic, and the sense of the meaning is that if you are perfect, you have come to an understanding. You have become mature. 
It was used oftentimes to describe, you know, heady teachers, men who had matured and seasoned and had things that, and understood things. And so uh, what the Lord is really wanting to do is he's wanting to, us to come to the same understanding as our Heavenly Father, to the same, pla- to the same level of maturity as our Heavenly Father. And, and uh, you know, if we, even just changing the word perfect to maturity, if we're talking about becoming like him, that's a daunting thing regardless. But that's the plan of Jesus. The wonderful plan that God has for your life is to make you perfect, is to bring you into the same understanding and maturity as our Heavenly Father has. And so there's a process through which he does that, and that's what we're going to talk about today. He said to do it, so we must be able to. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He didn't set us up for failure, did he? That's right. That's right. So we're going to start in Genesis, and uh, we're going to go back all the way to Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they meet the serpent. And I I want to start with um, the um, Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. Let's go ahead and read that. Then this is the devil talking to Eve. We're just going to jump right into the middle of the conversation. I always want to read this like a serpent, but I'm not going to today. (laughs) Do it in parcel tongue, yeah. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened, and as soon as you eat it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, I don't know. I might, I'm, I might be the only one here, but uh, has anybody else ever struggled with the whole concept of the fallenness of man and original sin? You know, like Adam sinned, and so now we are all born with a propensity to sin, and it's all Adam's fault because he disobeyed God, and so now we have a propensity to dis- disobey God. I, this never made sense to me. I've always struggled with that concept that man has fallen because I understand we're made in the image of God, and we've lost something, but, but the Lord began to un- unpack something for me here in Genesis 3 that really started to make sense to me. You see, you've got to understand that Adam disobeyed God before he ate the apple. Right? So Adam and Eve created in the image of God. He looked at him, he said it was good. They had the ability to disobey the Father long before the fall. That was built into them. They could obey or they could not obey. And they disobeyed before they were fallen. See, so, so this is not about they disobeyed, so now we're stuck. We have to disobey too. That's not the point. The issue of the fall is that their eyes were opened and they knew good and evil like the Father does. That's the issue. That's what happened. That's what happened in the fall is their eyes were open, and the devil made a promise to Eve. And he said, oh, if you eat this fruit, you're not going to die. He said, but your eye, the God knows that if you eat this fruit, your eyes are going to be open, you're going to become like him. And that was a half-truth. Fact is, they ate the apple, their eyes were opened, just like God. Now they understood good and evil, just like God. The only thing is, they weren't like God at all. And all of history has proven that since we ate that fruit and our eyes were opened and we, and we came into the knowledge of good and evil, the calamity, the harm, the suffering that we have caused to one another all throughout history proves that we aren't, God, we aren't like God at all. We got the knowledge, but we got it without any context. We got it outside of the rest of who God is. And so everything that's harmful that we do, all of the wars, all of the genocides, the Holocaust, all of it that happened, all of the things that we see happening right now, the injustices and the harm that we do to each other in this modern world happen out of our knowledge of good and evil. We, we, we have an understanding of what's right and what's wrong, and we're going to take action, we're going to get it fixed, even if it means we've got to go to war. Even if we got to kill people, we're going to make it right. And we see over and over and over again in history, we see these, these revolutions to right or wrong, and this, the government that comes into power to fix the problem ends up worse than the government they replaced. And when you think about the genocides of the world, they didn't begin or end with the Holocaust. 
Cheryl was just telling me the other day, she saw on international news that there's, there's mass killings happening in Nigeria again. Christians and Muslims have been fighting there for decades, and thousands of Christians are dying right now. That's just one nation. Stories like that happen a, a hundred times a, a year in our world, in many, many nations. We don't even hear about them. Besides all the atrocities and harm that we see happening in our own hometown, the murders, the senseless violence, all the things that we see, all of that has come as a result of our eyes being opened. And we've carried that forward, but we needed something to merge with it. The part that God has. And the part that God has that we needed to merge with it is love. See, God carries a knowledge of good and evil perfectly. He responds to good and evil perfectly. He responds to injustice perfectly. He brings justice perfectly alongside of mercy. Who can do that? Only God can do that. Why can God do that? Why can he, why can he merge justice and mercy and deal with all of these things that we end up on one side or the other but never in the right place? Isn't that, that's what ends up being, you know, something happens, I have a reaction, I get upset, I get angry, I got to do something about this, and it's all coming out of my knowledge of good and evil. This is wrong, we got to do something to make it right. But it's missing the component of Father's love that allows me to respond the way that He would. And so the goal that the Father has for us is to bring us into love. That's the setup. And what he uses to bring us into love, unfortunately, is all of the hardness in life's experiences. So I want to show you something. Again, in Genesis, let's go to the next section. Uh, we're going to read verses 14 through 19. We'll start with 14 and 15. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head, you will strike his heel. So this is the first mention of Messiah. And, uh, and I think, um, I don't have a lot to say about this because I, I believe that, that what the Lord is saying, is, is bringing here as he's speaking to the serpent and to Adam and Eve is a solution to the problem that they just caused, okay? And so, of course, this, the first solution is Messiah, who's going to bruise the head of the serpent, who's going to free us from his bondage, who's going to liberate us from death, who's going to wash away our sins and our shame, and all that we carry in terms of regret and make us new. That's the redemptive work of Jesus, obviously. And that's what the gospel is all about, that Robert wants us to become a visible community to share about. Amen, brother? Amen. <laughs> but let's look at verses 16 through 19. And uh, you can just read them all together, Cheryl. We'll just do all three, and then, and then we'll comment on it. Okay. Yeah. Then he said Before. to the woman... I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and pain, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Keep going. 17. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. How many of you have ever called this section of Scripture the curse, or heard it called the curse when people teach? I want to tell you something. This is not a curse. Father would never curse his children. This is the cure. That's what we need today. We need a cure. We need a cure because our eyes are opened to the knowledge of good and evil. 
and it caused all kinds of problems all through history. It made all kinds of problems for every single one of us. And so God provided in the same breath that he provided a cure, bringing Messiah to free us from the oppression of the serpent. He brought the cure in terms of a pathway in life to carry us into love. Because unfortunately, love is formed in the difficulties of our lives and our relationships. And so think about what he said here. You're going to have pain in childbirth. Let's just expand that a little bit. You're going to have pain in raising your children. Anybody here ever experienced pain raising their children? Your desire is going to be for your husband. He'll rule over you. Let's just expand that a little bit. How about pain in your marriage? Anybody ever suffered any pain in their marriage? Be marriage? Anybody find marriage can be difficult? Brad and Paul are saying, no, it's perfect for us. <laughs> had a, we'll get into this a little bit later, but when we got married, our pastor... He had a marriage sermon. I had actually heard it before our wedding, but he gave the same sermon for us. And in his sermon, he always says, he says, every couple fights. He says, if I ever hear a man say, I've never had a fight with my wife, he says, I know he's lying. <laughs> How about vocationally? Anybody ever struggle with their jobs? Anybody ever struggle with money? Anybody ever suffer pain trying to eke out a living? I mean, and, and we, live in a, we live in one of the wealthiest nations of the world, and we're all going crazy trying to make a living. What if you live in a place where everyone is starving to death? I mean, what if you live in a third world nation? And you know what really doesn't make sense to me? I've said this many times lately. How can we live in the wealthiest nation of the world and have so much depression, so much mental illness, and so much need for therapy and drugs? How can that be? We should be happy. We've got everything we want. But everything we want isn't the solution. And so the trials, whether you're in a third world nation or you live in America, you have trials in life. That's part of living. We all suffer in life in one way or another. Some of us suffer more severely than others. But each one of us has a package that we have lived through in our lives. And that package, God can use to form His love inside of us. Now, because we're fallen, because of all that we've done to each other, because of our knowledge of good and evil, we've increased the suffering exponentially. The Lord didn't put in here that He's going to make wars happen. We made wars happen. They're the most horrible things that have ever existed on, on, on the earth. How many, how many innocent civilians lost their lives in World War, World War II? 500 million? For what? So a crazy man could be stopped? None of it makes sense. I mean, it's all horrible. But but in your everyday life without those things and in your life with all of the harm that could come to you as a result of living in this world, God can do something deeper and richer in you than you could ever have imagined. And He can bring you into something that He is. That's His goal, is to, is to bring us with our knowledge of good and evil into Himself, into His love, so it can be folded into everything that He is so that we can be like Him. Because becoming like Him includes the knowledge of good and evil, but that's not good enough by itself. It's, it has no value without love, without being enfolded in love. You see, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, they were in the garden together. They were, they're symbiotic. You know, we, we know, we understand now that trees talk to each other through their roots. You know, so these two trees talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on in those roots. Yes, a lot going on in those roots. So now, I just let's just go to Jesus for a second, because what I want to suggest to you is that the pathway that God has for us to enter into understanding, maturity, perfection, 
is the same pathway he had for Jesus, and that's in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. So, Jesus, the Son of God, had to learn obedience. He had to be made perfect. I thought he was perfect. I thought he was God. Do you ever struggle with that verse? What, what in the world? What is this about? And uh, the answer is yes. And he learned, he, he was, but again, this, this is Greek now instead of Aramaic, but the sense of the word perfect is very similar to what we read about the Aramaic word. It has a sense of completion or maturity. It's not flawless. It's not like he was flawed and now he's been made flawless. It was like he needed to come to understanding. He needed to come to maturity. The Father brought him in his life to a place where he was like the Father. Whoa. But that's what, that's what it says in Hebrews. The Lord was doing things. The Father was doing things in his life to form his stature in him. And, and I, we, we tend, I think we tend to, to, when it says from the things which he suffered, we tend to think, we tend to go immediately to the cross, you know, from the things which he suffered. But I, I got a feeling he learned obedience and he became complete long before the cross. He had to live life just like you and I do. Cheryl and I were talking, we have different ideas on how this all works, but I mean, I just, sometimes I wonder what it was like for him to grow up as a little boy. He was different than all the other kids. Anybody grow up picked on by all the other kids? I wonder if he was picked on. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I mean, they had to eke out a living. They were poor. They maybe went hungry at night. He, was a, he, he lived a human life. That's one of the wonderful things about the series Ch The Chosen is you see a very human Jesus. So if he, lived a, if he lived a human life, he lived through the same hardships and trials and struggles, physically and emotionally, that all of us do. And the Holy Spirit used those, that same pathway to form in him everything that he was. Struggle with that a little bit? Just like us. Yeah, just like us. Just like us. Just like us. That was the point, wasn't it? Was for to him, him have to live just like us. See, yet without sin. See, that, that, was, that was the point. He, he lived through everything we have, and he came into completion. And the and, and so the pathway he took brought him to completion. I want to tell you, the pathway God has for you can bring you to completion. It can bring you to perfection. That's his plan. That is the wonderful plan he has for your life, is to change you, transform you, bring you into something that changes the way you see the world, the way you respond to what's happening in the world. It doesn't come out of just your sense of justice or injustice, right and wrong, what has or hasn't got to be done. It comes out of something much larger, out of the very heart and love of the Father. His response is so different. Right? And at least when I compare it to my responses, <laughs> I fall way short of the Father's responses. I'm so glad I got Brian because he keeps bringing me back to the Father's love sometimes when I'm ready to rage and... And he talks, and I say, oh, Brian, you just, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad that every day you say, Jesus, I need more of you. <laughs> so, this happens in every aspect of our lives, but let's just take one that's obvious for many of us, and that's marriage. As I, as I said, our pastor, when he married us, in his message said that, Every, every, every married couple fights. Well, you know what my response was to that? We were pretty brand new Christians. We were, we were filled with the Holy Ghost. We were raging for Jesus. And I said, no, that's not true. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have to fight. Did you say that out loud to him? No, I said it in my mind. <laughs> I knew we would fight. 
You're smarter than I am. <laughs> I didn't like what he said. But yeah. I knew. Well, I proved him right on the third night of our honeymoon. <laughs> We had, we had driven all the way to Denver. We were going to go backpacking in the Colorado Rockies, and we were in Denver. We were in a hotel, and we, we thought, well, we need to go out to a nice restaurant. We picked some Asian restaurant. And at that time, when we went to Lian Chin's, her family was a big Lian, not, was not Lian Chin. What was that place? Nankin, downtown. They would go to the Nankin. Nankin. And they'd all order all these Chinese dishes, Chinese dishes, and I would order steak. That was my, I mean, I, you know, I was very limited in what food was good or I'm, the Lord, she's changed me a lot, <laughs> thankfully. So we get to this Asian restaurant and, there, and there's a menu. I can't understand a single thing that's on it. And I started to get really crabby. It was like, why are we here? This is horrible. It was well, a soup. It was started with a soup. Like a, a bowl of... Broth. broth that you could see through <laughs> with maybe one or two things yeah. in it. You know, you know. Well, and in a know, matter of about 10 minutes, she left the restaurant crying. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that he, you know, would be this way. I thought he was happy. Um, what's this, yeah. you know? So I went out outside, and I was just like, you know, Lord, what, what shall I do? I don't like this. Help me to know what to do. Yeah. So we struggled through all our baggage in the early years of our marriage, just like a lot of young couples do, I think. And, mm -hmm. and then we met some good friends from Ireland named Paul and Hillary Kyle, and uh, we spent a lot of time with them, and some, you know, some some time ago now, a couple of decades ago, actually. But but they did a marriage retreat one weekend, and we went to it, and it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody suggest that the purpose for marriage was not to make us happy, but to make us holy. Never heard that. And uh, if any of you have discovered Gary Thomas's book, Sacred Marriage. His byline to that is, what if God designed marriage to make us holy, not happy? That book is the greatest devotional I've ever read. It changed my life forever, if you, if you really want a good devotional. Um, but that's really true. The hardships of your marriage, God has purposely designed to change you. Mm -hmm. We work so hard to change each other so that we can be happy. We got it all wrong. The person God is trying to change in all your marital difficulties is not the other person, it's you. Mm -hmm. And in, in our hardest years, we had a couple of years that were really, we really struggled. And I was pastoring and I was really busy in ministry and a little long and short of it, I, the Lord had to reveal to me that my mistress was the ministry and Cheryl was being abandoned in a lot of different ways. And it took a couple of years to get there. And he did wonderful things in her during that time. But you know what was really cool at the end of that is we found out we were both saying the both We were both praying the same prayer. And the prayer generally was, Lord, please, whatever you have to do to change me, change me. Change me. And then we would always end it with, and if, if they need any change, you can do that too. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. But first it was change. First it was, it was a brokenness before the Lord and a willingness to let him transform my life. And as much as we struggled with each other in that season, we, the Lord helped us not to blame each other, but to look to God to transform us. This is what God wants to do with you in your marriage in your child rearing, in your life, in your losses, in your pain, is he wants you to come to him so that he can form his heart in you and change the person that you are. And I'm sorry to say it, it's the pain that allows him to do that. Who would have thought his wonderful plan involves pain? Pain is good. Pain is good. No pain, no gain. <laughs> or as we said over Butch last week, for momentary light afflictions have produced in you an eternal weight of glory. That's right. 
Church was suffering under Rome, and Paul said, momentary light afflictions. They weren't just struggling with the normal things of life. They were struggling with the horrible things that men do to each other. And Paul called them momentary light afflictions. Because he understood that it's in those afflictions that the Father calls us to a deeper place of understanding, and he forms in us his love. In order to make it through your marriage, you have to learn how to forgive. In order to make it through life, you have to learn how to forgive. You know, and, and I mean, we understand when there's a, a deep tragedy and a great harm has been done, you just don't walk up to a person and say, well, you know you have to forgive them. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, if you don't let the Father bring you to that and you allow bitterness and revenge and anger to fill your heart and carry you forward, your soul will shrivel. Amen. And Jesus wants your soul to be whole. Amen. But all of these things are formed in the furnace of affliction. I'm sorry to say. This is a very intimate thing. It is. Father. It really is. He becomes so close to us in these times. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we've seen that with good friends who we walked with through cancer all the way to their parting to be with Jesus. And I mean, you guys know people in, in their deepest sorrows, they were deeply transformed. They became so much like Jesus. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was crazy. You know, John Thielen and Eric Jensen and these guys who... Had, I mean, they didn't die suddenly, but in, the, in that journey, wow, Jesus got close, you know. Um, Deb Osk was another one, just watching the Lord do these things in their lives, you know. <clears throat> so here, but here's the good news. If we let the Father work out his wonderful plan for our life, we will come into a place of complete happiness. If we let the Lord do what he wants to do in our marriages, in me, we will come into happy marriages. The end result is happiness. It's just not the goal. <laughs> you see, the goal is godliness. He wants to make us like him. And the way he makes us like him is he brings us into love. Make sense? So, uh, here's another scripture. I think we got time for it. Um, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, it's easy to interpret that from our Western worldview, but let's fold that into Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God causes everything to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? You're called according to his purpose. His purpose is for you to become perfect, to become like the Father. And everything that happens in your life, God works together for good. What's the good? To make you like the Father. You see? And in our, from our Western worldview, it means like, oh, everything's going to be okay. The bills will all get paid. I won't be homeless. I won't lose the house. I won't lose my job. I'll get a better job. I'll find a better wife. <laughs> right? Oh, God caused my divorce to work out for good. I got a better wife. <laughs> And I, and I don't mean to disparage anybody that's been married again and you had a horrible first marriage and now you got a wonderful second marriage and I'm very, very glad for you and so is Jesus. But from our Western point of view, we think that everything working together for good means it all gets fixed in the end. But it doesn't get fixed, not the way that we tend to think. It gets fixed by the transformation of our hearts. See. 
And interestingly enough, this very scripture, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, I think someplace I have, if I can find it. One, two, three. Do you have, yeah, here we are, Matthew 5. We're going to go back to Matthew 5, 48, but I want to read verses 43 to 48 because we're going to fold be perfect into the context of what Jesus was actually saying, okay? So we're going to kind of wrap this up with Matthew this. 5, 43 through 48. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. See, the final statement is made in the context of love. How are you going to love? Are you going to love your friends only or your enemies too? Are you going to love those who are only good to you or those who do harm to you? Are you going to love only those who are familiar to you, or are you going to love strangers? Are you going to love only those who agree with you, or will you love the people who think differently than you? Are you going to love only the people in your church, or will you love people in other denominations too? Will you love only the Christians, or will you love people of other religions too? Or will you love people who don't believe in God too? You see? The only way you can do that is for the Father to form his love in you. And I was, I was contemplating one day, just the Lord had done some random wonderful thing, and like he always does for us, and I was thinking, Lord, how do you, how do you love so perfectly? How, how do you do that? It's, you know, you do it so perfectly. There's no, you know, you, it's, you know, can't even find words to describe it. <laughs> right? And he said, well, he said, it's not because I'm loving. He said, it's because I am love. And then he said, my goal is not to teach you how to be loving. My goal is to make you love. See, we, we struggle so hard as Christians. We want to learn how to be loving. We try to be loving. Loving is just something we put on top of ourselves, our, our old selves. Jesus wants to transform you. He wants to make you love like he is love. What does that look like? I don't know, but I want to go there. I want to go there. I want to become love. <laughs> Say something. Me too. <laughs> it's a lifelong journey. It's not an easy journey. But every loss we experience, all of your losses this year, Pastor Brian, God is using every one of them to do something deeper and richer inside of you. <clears throat> yeah, we, we don't want it. And, and let's just not forget that in the middle of all this, God does miracles. He provides. He protects. He heals us. He acts in so many profound ways towards us. He makes our lives so wonderful in so many ways. He loves us. He's our Father. And yet, we are not exempt from struggles. We are not exempt from pain. We're not exempt from suffering. And he didn't intend that we should be. Right? I remember when Amber, when she was like 17, she was having all these car troubles, and she got stalled in the worst place on the 
on a freeway entrance, you know, and, and it, she, she just like, when I got, you know, she called me and I got there and she's like in tears. She says, how come if God loves me, my car won't start? <laughs> Anybody ever wondered things like that? <laughs> you know, I, I was driving to run an errand yesterday and I saw this guy, he had a, a mini dump truck with a trailer on it stalled at the left turn lane going into Holiday right in the middle of traffic. And I, as is, you know, before I even realized that I could help him, I drove by and, oh, well, I missed that opportunity, which is pretty normal for me. I miss all my opportunities. You know, I'm just on my way. <clears throat> but I ended up, I forgot something at home. I turned around, came back, and there he was still there with a squad car behind him. And the thought came to me, you know, you know Jeff, you have AAA. You could help him get a tow for free. So I went home, got what I came, came back. Well, in the meantime... Somebody with a pickup had attached a chain and pulled him out of the intersection into the holiday station. And so I parked there and I went over and said, hey, I can help you with a tow. Would you like me to call AAA? I think they'll do it for free. <laughs> he said, sure. <laughs> you know, so I'm in the middle of calling AAA and some other guy walks up, some random guy walks up and says, hey, I'm a diesel mechanic. Can I help you? <laughs> can you believe it? This guy, in a matter of 10 minutes, three people stopped to help him. That is the goodness of God. I mean, we are capable of those things, but for me, it was really a new thing to stop and help somebody like that. That's not what I do. So I told Cheryl, I said, I kind of got delayed on my errand. I stopped and helped somebody, and she said, really? Oh, well, that's nice. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm starting to become love. <laughs> Step right in. What's that? Step right in. Step right in. Step right in. We see lots of acts of love. I mean, you know, love is something that the Father put in us because of his image. So we see it in a lot of places in the world, but it's not the same as becoming it. And this is what he's calling you to. What do you think? The place you want to go? I mean, life is hard anyways. Why not, why not let it produce something good? <laughs> so let's stand together. <clears throat> I think we'll keep sitting because I'm not sure that you can see us if we stand, but thank you, Lord. I want to pray for just, you can just join me. We're going to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and give him permission to just bring us into this place that he wants to work out his wonderful plan for our lives. It truly is a wonderful plan, just not the wonderful plan that you envisioned. That's all. It's better. But just think what the church will be if he actually does this in our hearts. Father, thank you for the journey that you have planned for us. Thank you for the cure that you created in the garden, the pathway to healing, to wholeness, to love. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that every day in our struggles... You call us to look to you, to trust you, to yield to you so that you can form in us deeper and richer truth. And you can bring us from where we are to a place of love. And Lord, if it's your desire in all of these sufferings to bring us to love, then we say yes. We want to go there with you. It seems impossible, but it seems so exciting to become the kind of people that Jesus was when he walked on this earth. To be like that in what we see and how we see it and how we respond. So we yield to you and we trust you and we ask you, Lord, do your work. Work in our lives. Work when we're resisting you. Work when we're yield to you. Don't stop working. Don't listen to us when we're whining. Thank you how careful you are as you bring us forward into the very things that you've called us to. And that day by day, you form in us your very heart.
There may be somebody here or listening online. You've never even met Jesus. That's the start. That's the start of the journey. And if you're one of those people or you've been away from Jesus for a long time and you need to come back, just right now, just, just tell him, I'm coming back to you, Lord. I open my heart to you, Jesus. Please come in. Start my life again with your mercy, with your forgiveness, and fill me with your new life and your Holy Spirit. That prayer will change your life forever. Just breathe it to Jesus right now, and I guarantee he will hear it, and he will answer it, and your life will change. And if you're in a place of need, this message isn't designed to make you fatalistic and say, well, I guess I just have to suffer through it. Part of the pathway into this maturity includes trusting him in the most difficult times to bring his solutions. He works us through these times. Many times he doesn't interrupt them, but he brings us through them. And in that process, we see miracles. And I thoroughly believe that many times we experience miracles, we just don't see them or understand that that's what they are. But our Father is always working in our behalf. He is our greatest advocate, and He is our Savior in many, many ways. So if you need a healing today, if, you need, if you're short on your rent today, if you need a job today, if you need a relationship restored today, if you're struggling with depression or some other form of mental illness today, nothing is beyond our Father's ability to do a miracle. So whatever it is that you are carrying, struggling with right now, if you want to ask God for a miracle, you have every right to do it because he loves to hear you come to him. So raise your hand and just say, Jesus, you see my need and I trust you. And I ask you for a miracle. What do we think of Jerry Uzel in the hospital in Arizona? We ask you for a miracle. Think of friends right here at Hope who are struggling with cancer and other illnesses. We ask you for a miracle. Think of Brian and Butch. Think of Nikki recovering from her surgery and learning how to use those legs again. We ask you for a miracle. We think of Chanson. We ask you for a miracle. No, we're not hesitant to ask you, Father. We thank you that we can trust you and expect your hand of great goodness and mercy upon us. 